Hello and welcome to the Leaders Room again. This is Mohamed Sabri from Eclipse. He has run seven marathons in seven continents within 70 days. He has done the prestigious Boston and the London Marathon within seven days of each other. He has been to the North Pole and done the Antarctic Marathon. Dr. William Tan is a resident physician at the Singapore Cancer Clinic who holds a first class degree from Harvard University, United States of America. And by the way, Dr. Tan is also paralyzed from the waist down since he was a child because of polio. We're so proud to have Dr. Tan with us this afternoon. Thank you. Thank and you. Welcome to Leaders Room, Dr. Tan. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to ask you a question about your childhood. You have been paralyzed from the waist down as a result of contacting polio. How old were you at the time, Dr. Tan? Just two years old. I was uh, missing on polio vaccination. Um, and with the epidemic coming over to this part of the world, I was one of those very unfortunate children to succumb to it. And, and I understand that um, despite your, your physical disabilities, your parents insisted that you be sent to a quote-unquote normal school, a regular school. What did that do to you initially? Honestly, I was too young to understand the significance of it until I grew older and I realized there was a, a, a powerful reason for doing so that my parents really want me to uh, connect with other children who are able-bodied and be integrated right. with them. Right. And they also believe that in a mainstream school, mm -hmm. I will, uh, no matter how difficult it is, to receive all the kind of uh, educational training right. and eventually the opportunities as well. Mm. Uh, my parents recognize that there's no easy way out for me, even though um, it might be difficult for other kids to accept me with a disability. So true, true enough that uh, I find it very, very difficult to get along with other kids and the other kids find me very different and they ha had a tendency to bully me. Uh, this was character building because uh, it taught me how I can uh, learn how to manage conflicts with my classmates, my mm. schoolmates. And by, do by learning the skills at a very young age, That's right. uh, it ha has put me ready for the rest of the world and my journey. Looking at your resume, I mean, one can't help but be, uh, be impressed by it. And, and, and the question that comes to my mind is, have you always been such a high-achieving person? Um, I attributed it to the setbacks I had when I was really young. Um, my parents strongly believe in the power of education, mm -hmm. that education can transform people. And they were nurturing, and I was encouraged, and I gave it the hard work to do and do well and excel in school. Mm -hmm. And not only that, my parents also encouraged me that I must compensate for what I don't have. So there was, as I grew up, uh, I was in this mindset of making up for my losses. I lost the ability to walk. I'm paralyzed from the waist down. So what I have, the brain and the upper body, and how can I maximize the brain, maximize my upper body? I think we have more than co compensated for that. <laughs> Congratulations. I'm so inspired by you sharing this now. Um, I would like to, see, uh, to ask you this. Um, your father uh, um, was selling um, uh, sometimes fried bananas by the roadside and things like that. And he came from China as a young man. Uh, what were some of the values that from your father, you know, um, I, I believe hard work would be one of them that you, that you um, have taken with you to your adult years as well? There are many things I've learned from my dad. For one thing, uh, I realized that it was very humbling for my father because he came from a very rich family in China. And during that time, he was wanting to leave the communist system to come to this part of the world. Mm. Um, and he actually lived behind everything and starting from scratch in Southeast Asia. Right. He worked in Malaysia for a while and then after that he went back to Singapore right. and he was working as a clerical officer, mm. a white collar job and then he was uh, asked to leave because he was spending too much time with me since I was disabled and then he tried all kinds of 
livelihood. He was selling drinks and it failed. He was selling all kinds of other uh, f and yeah. it failed. And finally, he tried fried bananas in a push cart. And what I've learned from him is that never give up because that has shown to us it was difficult. Yeah. It was a lot of setback, yeah. one after another. Right. It was very humbling to fail. Mm. And I learned from him, it doesn't matter how many times you fail, but it makes a difference how many times you get up. And that makes the difference, to be able to get up when one falls. And after so many years of studying and hard work, you finally were uh, given admission into the, um, uh, the medical college in, uh, in Australia. And how, how did that feel? It's uh, euphoric because the news came on my birthday mm. on the 22nd of January, okay, that's right. 1997. Yes. The interview took a long time. Um, and I give my very best. And I'm very grateful to the selection committee of the University of Newcastle in Australia right. for recognizing my abilities uh, and to see me as a person beyond the wheelchair. Because for too long, many people who are decision makers yeah, yeah. will look at me as somebody who is crippled, confined to right. a wheelchair. Right. And this is, I call it nurturing. When the, when the selection committee believed that with nurturing, William would make the, a great doctor on a wheelchair. And for this, I'm very grateful. And, and then you served in Australia for quite a number of years. Yes. And upon your return to become the resident physician, the National Cancer Clinic in Singapore, you went to, um, to a marathon in Paris. And that's when you discovered something else was not quite right with yes. your, your body. And that's when you discovered you're suffering from stage four leukemia. Yes. Uh, for a person to be um, uh, suffering from polio since um, a tender age like you did, and then be face to face with uh, leukemia uh, twice in a lifetime, Dr. Tan, um, where did you get your strength? In initially, I was very devastated. I wasn't able to face the news with courage. I was angry because I have gone through tough times with a childhood disability, with all these discrimination when I was growing up, with all the tough journey, and I thought I have gone through tough times, and my, the rest of my life journey will be smooth sailing, not knowing that at the age of 51, such a terrible illness dawned on me, a stage 4 leukemia, and I find it very hard to accept. It was a big struggle. It was a dilemma whether I should receive treatment or not because I have uh, 9 to 12 months as the prognosis indicated. Should I live the 9 to 12 months doing the bucket list or I go for treatment? And many cancer patients would say it's very hard going to chemotherapy. And for me, I need a transplant as well of my bone marrow. So you've gone from being a high-flying Paralympian, a highly successful doctor, and then your cancer uh, patient as well. Um, even you, I, I suspect, would have some good days and some not so good days. Um, I would like to ask you, when you're going through a really bad day, what goes on in your mind? Where do you go to to get that energy uh, um, boost to walk you through the entire bad day? Very much indeed. It was ups and downs. I was literally back to zero. As you say, I was in the pinnacle of my life. That's right. Paralympic races, world record holder, you know, as a physician, right. and suddenly I can't train anymore. I can't go and work as a physician anymore. And I'm, I'm down to zero, down deep, deep in the pit. And I say that I'm just mortal as everybody else. I find that I've lost the meaning to life, I've lost the purpose, I've lost, I've lost uh, the dreams. And right in front of me is how can I survive the chemotherapy, but it wasn't easy. There were times I feel like giving up, and I felt that it was better, easier for me. After all, I have to die anyway. Everyone has to die anyway. So what's wrong with me dying now? 
And then I thought, no, I think mom would be too sad. Mom who has brought me up all these years as a child with disability, dying before her, that would be devastating, it would break her heart. And then I remember my parents were great leaders in the family who taught me from young how never, ever, ever given up, no matter how hard circumstances can be. Why am I not doing it? Why am I giving up? And I say to myself, for the sake of my mom, that has passed away, for the sake of my fiance, Stephanie, for the sake of my love, the loved ones, my siblings and my friends, and for myself, I need to go through the treatment. And it would be meaningful for a doctor to go through cancer. And when I go back to work as a, cancer, as a doctor at a cancer center, I can be an inspiration. So I derive strength when I see the meaning of it. When I saw the purpose of my suffering, I derive strength and energy. You are an inspiration to so many people out there. Um, but at your age right now, in your situation right now, who inspires you? Um, along my journey, I say that I have been inspired by many people. I owe it to them for who I am. For my mom and dad were great examples, who were strong, resilient, determined, and they were the ones who were my pillars. And as I grew up, and I saw other people with disability, Mr. Johnny Ang, who is paralyzed from the, the neck down, a man who is so disabled and so full of leadership energy, who will go out there and write articles using a special device in his mouth to type the words. I watch him type by the bedside of the hospital and words, the powerful words, to influence decision makers and making a difference. I'm inspired. I was inspired by such people. And of course, my teacher, Dr. Shirley Lim, how Dr. Lim helped me in school when I had some difficulties with transportation. From home to school became a long journey when the school moved to a new premise. This was in Singapore. In Singapore. It was a new school. But it means new trouble for me because a trishaw rider won't bring me there anymore because it's too far. And Dr. Shirley Lim pledged to drive me. She made such a big effort the rest of my secondary education for three years, driving me to school and back every day. From a child stricken by polio, you went on to, um, um, to perform very well in your primary school. And you outperformed yourself again in secondary school and became a first class honors degree holder from Harvard University. And you went on to become um, a doctor at the cancer clinic in, in, the, in Singapore. And then you become a Paralympian. May I ask you, what's next? Oh, well, I'm very grateful for this second chance of life, a new lease of life. I'm seven years in remission, which I celebrated last month. And given this second chance in life, I treasure it a lot. And I'm very grateful, very much, full of gratitude to my oncologist at the National University Hospital in Singapore, mm -hmm. to my friend who is also an oncologist, Dr. Ben Mao, who treated me as well. And I want to do more for humanity. And I think that with great energy, comes great responsibility. And I think I may not be Spider-Man, but I want to go out there and accomplish a lot more for others, for those people who are in need. So there are a couple of things that line up for me. I'll still, I'm back to wheelchair racing last year. And I will embark on more and more sporting endeavors. I've just returned from a race from London to Paris, 500 kilometers in four days to raise money for cancer research. Um, the next one will be the Boston Marathon, my 10th Boston Marathon in April next year. And I will work towards Tokyo 2020, the Paralympics, and then I'll retire and become an, uh, a volunteer sports administrator to nurture the younger athletes. Sounds like a superb 
fantastic plan. Dr. William Tan, thank you for spending up some time with us. Uh, this is Mohamed Sabri again signing off from the Leaders Room at Eclif. Thank you for tuning in.